Praise God. I'd like to talk to you about the fourth dimension here tonight. I want to remember the words of David when he said, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Four things he mentioned there that would cover every area of our lives. And he's not talking about going to heaven there. He's just simply saying, Who shall ascend into that divine and holy and wonderful and sacred presence of God, the hill of the Lord, and stand in his holy place? What a beautiful atmosphere that surrounds that wonderful throne of God. No wonder the angels cry holy. No wonder the seraphims with twain they cover their face, with twain they cover their feet, and with twain they do fly. Because they are in that rare atmosphere of the holy of holies, the holy God where his Holy Spirit moves, where his holy angels work, where his holy throne is, who shall ascend into that special place, the hill of the Lord, and stand in his holy place. A few years ago, the astronauts on one of their journeys into outer space took some medicine with them. The scientists tried their best to find a way to perfectly mix a formula here on the earth, and they could not do it. Finally, they decided the only place where this could be mixed properly was in an atmosphere where there was perfect balance. There was no gravity, earth pull, no moon pull. It was just simply out there in space, outer space of weightlessness. And they found out they were able to mix together a medication, antibiotics that they could not mix perfectly here upon the earth. They had to get into another realm. They had to ascend into another place. They had to climb a little higher than the earth's atmosphere. That's what happens when we ascend into the hill of the Lord. That's why we can stand in his holy place and find the perfect answer that we need. It cannot be found any other way. There are no shortcuts. There is no easy way. There is no such thing as name it and claim it. Believe it and receive it. It all comes by paying a price. The very man who wrote this was called a man after God's own heart. God said it. Here's a man after my own heart because he has done all of my will. Yet there's never been a man in the Bible that has had as many ups and downs as David has had. There's never been a man that has had the spiritual highs and the discouraging lows like this man had. He was there. He went through the valleys. He knew what it was. He was able to say, Why art thou cast down on my soul on one hand? And then on the other hand, he could say, By my God, I can run through a troop, and I can leap over a wall. He could say, My enemy has, uh, has built a trench around me. And then he could say, Some trust in horses, some in chariots, but we will trust in the name of the Lord. So there was the great spiritual highs. And then there certainly were those depths of despair that he went through. But he's the one who said this. He said we can get there if we have clean hands and a pure heart. We have not lifted up our soul into vanity, and we have not sworn deceitfully. There were several things about David that I want to mention here tonight before I get to that fourth dimension. First of all, this man showed strength of character when he was concerned about the innocent and the helpless. He would uh, wade into a lion or a bear in order to spare a little lamb. That's the way he felt at the very beginning when he was chosen. His concern, his compassion, and his love. There was something about the heart of a man like that. God said, I like that. He had that same spirit and attitude even at the end of his ministry. Because when he numbered Israel and God said, you're going to be punished for it, he said, let it all fall on me. Don't let it fall on those innocent sheep. They didn't have anything to do with it. 
So there was something about this man that attracted the attention of God. The Lord loved that spirit and attitude. He stood for a cause when he had to stand alone. When everybody else turned their back and was afraid to go fight the enemy, David said, I will go because I represent a cause. The cause we represent here tonight, the cause we represent in this conference is bigger than any individual. You may think you're somebody till you stand up here. You don't feel too good about yourself when you stand here. You sort of feel like you're all alone, but you know that you represent a cause. That cause is greater than any individual. And the Lord said, I like that. I like a man who will stand up and be counted with everybody else is falling backward everybody else is failing he said i like that he knew what to do with the spirit of jealousy when it was raging against him he was able to deal with it in the spirit of the lord that god had worked through his life he did not take vengeance upon an enemy when the enemy came against him he said i want no part of vengeance that doesn't belong to me. I refuse to have any part of that attitude. God said, I like that. He knew how to weep over the downfall of an enemy as well as a friend. When we can weep when an enemy falls and lift our voice. And David cried all day when Saul went down to defeat. There was something about it. It gripped his heart. God said, I like that spirit. He proved to be a man of his word when he told his friend Jonathan, I promise you I will remember you for your kindness, for the love you have shown. You stood by me as a friend. I will not forget. And finally, when he became king over Israel, it dawned on him one day that he must keep his word. And he said, Is there anybody left of the house of Saul? that I could show kindness for Jonathan's sake. And they said, there is a man, but you wouldn't be interested in him because he's a cripple. He can't get around very well. He said, let me have this man. They fetched the Mephibosheth out of Lodibar, and they brought him to the king's house and put his feet under the king's table. And I would have you know, when he got his feet under the king's table, he looked just like the rest. You couldn't tell that he was a cripple. We have come here wounded in the battle. Many of you have come from the north and the south and the east and the west. You feel crippled in your spirit. You don't feel like you could go any further, but you've been sitting under the king's table. You've been feasting on the good word of the Lord. You've been challenged all over again. We're here to receive a challenge, to renew our faith, and to go in a direction that God wants the church to go in this hour. Praise God. When he was not permitted to build the temple, he was the kind of man that could prepare for the one who was to build it. Had no jealousy. I won't get to build it, so I don't care if it never gets built. He got all the materials together. He worked hard so that when Solomon came along, his work was a lot easier. I praise God for Brother Mangan. I praise God for these folks. I praise God for men of God. I need to say it. Brother Mangan is a man of God. He's a man that's been misunderstood, but he's a dead man. You could compliment him, it wouldn't make any difference. You could talk about him, it didn't matter at all. He's still up there shouting. He's still waving his hand. He's still in the thick of the battle. And even though, even though he could not build this temple by himself, God helped him to prepare. He prepared the building. He prepared the people. He prepared through fasting and prayer and dedication. And God allowed his son to come along and build this magnificent building tonight. 
Thank God for the spirit of a man like that. Thank God for an attitude like that. Somehow the spirit, if I can't do it, I don't care if it never gets done. I remember the last conference my dad went to. He'd never been able to preach at a general conference. Had never been called upon. Baptized more people than anybody in the UPC. Built more churches than anybody in the UPC. But on the way up there, we sat down in a restaurant, and he always carried his Bible, and he laid it on the table. I said, Dad, oh, I wish you were preaching at this conference. In those days, they waited and chose the speakers when you got there. He said, son, he said, if I'm called upon, I have a message. But he said, I don't care if I'm never in the limelight. I just want God to make me smaller and smaller. I just want to be involved in his work. I couldn't help it. I, I wept. I had been called upon to preach. I had been called upon to preach meetings everywhere. And here the man that was really qualified was not able, was not called upon. He was a rough evangelist. He made it tough on people. And I suppose that's the reason. But thank God for men who have a vision, have foresight, and men like Brother Manga, who can build character, who can build strength, who can fight the devil, who can pray till he touches God, who can raise up a people for the name of Jesus and for the glory of God. I think they deserve a good hand, Brother and Sister Mangan. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Mangan, for always being there. Thank you for always showing the right spirit in it. I love you and I appreciate you. Praise God. He's my hero. I love this man very much. Praise God. And then probably the main reason that David was a man after God's own heart was because at the end of his journey and all of his ups and downs, all of his spiritual highs and discouraged lows, he did not want any spotlights at the end of his journey. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, O God, and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Search me. You know, we need the searchlight. And I guess God wants to turn the searchlight on some of us. We've been in the spotlight long enough. You see, when we're in the spotlight, he doesn't get the glory. But when the searchlight is upon us, we want him to get all of the glory. And I pray that God would search every one of us this last night of this meeting. And if there's any wicked way in any of us, we could get rid of it so that we can ascend into the hill of the Lord and we can stand in his holy place. No wonder he could say in Psalm 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew in me the right spirit. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. He wanted to deal with his own spirit and he certainly wanted the Holy Spirit. There are four expressions of the spirit there that I want to dwell on just for a few moments here. The spirit that moved upon the face of the deep. The spirit that moved Samson at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Estal was the spirit that would thrust men, that would impel men, that would drive men. There's something about the spirit. That spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. I'm not talking about a harshness, a rudeness. I'm not talking about a whip kind of driving. I'm talking about the deep inner working of the Spirit that drives you, that will thrust you out, 
that will impel you, that will put desires within you, that will cause you to go deeper than you've ever gone because you want to ascend into the hill of the Lord. If I can just reach that fourth dimension, I know that everything's going to be all right. That spirit that impels, that spirit that drives, that spirit that will thrust you out, uh, that's in an area that you may not be familiar with, in an area that you may not be comfortable with. But if the Spirit does it, I promise you, it will be all right. When Brother Ewan was preaching that masterful message here this evening, I wept, I wept, because it brought back so many memories. I can remember as a boy traveling along with the mother and dad and all the children, the gospel work, how so many times we didn't know where the next meal would come from. We didn't know Dad would take a stick and put it in that old gas tank and look at it. And then he'd try to figure out the miles he was going to have to travel. Didn't have a dime in his pocket. But somehow the gas always got us there. It was the loving hand of God that seemed to keep thrusting and impelling and driving because there was a lost world out there. There were souls that had not been stirred yet. There were hearts that had never been touched yet. There were songs they had never heard yet. There was a feeling they had never experienced as yet. And the Spirit was thrusting them, impelling them, and driving them to go a little bit further. And then the second, uh, the second meaning of the Spirit was the Spirit smiting, smiting upon the heart. Uh, that's the language of the Spirit smiting you you know the lord has smitten all of us at some time or another i, I i'll tell you i don't uh, i don't always like it when i'm going through those experiences but i know when they're all over that's the best thing that ever happened to me when the lord begins to smite me and uh, when i don't pray like i should the lord smites me and the spirit begins to talk to me when I'm not as close to God as I need to be, I can feel a smiting, a deep inner smiting of the Spirit of God. When you talk about something, if you're sensitive to the Lord, there's going to be a smiting in your heart. When you're guilty of criticizing, there will be a smiting, a deep inner smiting of the Spirit that will tell you, you can't do that. That's not right. Thank God for the work of the Spirit. He's still working on me. He's still working on me. Praise God. I'll make a little confession. A few years ago, I called a man long distance, a preacher, and I talked rough to him. I talked hateful to him, and I felt uh, real proud of myself because I thought I was in the right until I hung up the phone. And then when I hung up the phone, the Spirit began to smite me. Uh, I tried to get busy with something else and get my mind off of it, but the Spirit began to smite me. I don't mind to confess to you. I don't mind to tell you that a man that can hold a high position in the United Pentecostal Church can fail. I don't mind to tell you that he can have the wrong feelings. I don't mind to tell you that I'm human enough that I can make those mistakes. But I'm so glad for the Spirit of God within me that will smite me, that will bring me to my knees. That will cause me to want to pray. And I uh, picked up the phone finally after a few hours, and I just had to do it. I got him on the other end of the line. I said, my brother, I have sinned. I have done wrong. And uh, he tried to apologize too. I said, no, no, you're not the one to apologize. The Spirit smote me. I've got to make it right with you. If I am not in harmony with you, I cannot be in harmony with God. And so I'm asking you to forgive me. And when we settled it all and I hung up that phone, I had a good, clean, clear, wonderful feeling. Thank God the condemnation was gone. And I had to say, thank you, Lord, 
that you can smite with your spirit. You can bring us to our knees. You can cause us to want to pray through and make us want to repent. I'm going to tell you to ascend into the hill of the Lord and to stand in his holy place. We better ask God, smite me, Lord. Bring me down low. Let me get my head on the carpet. But, oh, God, don't leave me. Amen. Take not your holy, smiting spirit from me. Praise God. The third dimension of the spirit is it strikes. Striking like on the anvil of the soul. Now that's, that's another thing. There's a lot of confusion that's reigning in our midst. From the north, south, east, to west. What about standards? What about convictions? I want to settle it for you here tonight. You want me to settle it for you? All right, I'll settle it. There are three ways you can have a conviction. First of all, there's that conviction that comes from the Word of God. You put your finger on the verse and say, I believe it because God's Word said it. I believe in one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's a conviction. I base it upon the Scripture. I appreciated what Brother Mannion said at the close of the meeting last night. Brother Arnold, you'll never know what you said here last night, how the impact it made upon this congregation. You brought out some beautiful things about water baptism in the name of Jesus and how the blood is in that name. I'll never forget that. I always believed it, but I didn't. I, I never had heard it like that, and I didn't always understand it. You certainly enlightened me last night. And then when Brother Mangan stood up here and said, we receive power when we receive the Holy Ghost, but the authority comes in the name of Jesus. That did something to me. That had better be a conviction in your heart. Don't care what anybody else out there is doing. Don't care what anybody else out there believes. Don't care what church out there is doing whatever. You've got to have that conviction, and it's based upon the Word of God. I found it all in the Word of the Lord. I found it all. It's in God's Word. We're going to leave Alexandria, Louisiana because of the times with a brand new conviction in our hearts that the message of salvation is the message of the hour. Not just essential, not just necessary, but absolutely essential. We still believe you've got to repent of your sins, be baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and receive the Holy Ghost and live a life of holiness and when we see it in the Word that a woman must have long hair that's a conviction that's biblical when we see it in the Word that a man should have short hair that's a conviction in the Word of God alright now now that's settled that's a conviction that's Bible-based. We need to clap our hands about that. Praise God. There is another conviction. And that comes from men like we've heard here this week who in their fasting and prayer have wrestled with bad fashions. There's, there's no scripture that says rock music is wrong. There is no scripture you can point to that says television is wrong. There is no scripture that says movies are wrong per se. No scripture. No scripture that says smoking cigarettes will send you to hell. Yet <clears throat> we know that that's a conviction. Where did we get that conviction? Men that wrestled in their spirit. 
in prayer and dedication, wrestling, as it were, with the very forces of hell. And I've had to do it. I've had to do it many times. I felt like I was wrestling with the very powers of darkness to get a hold of something that I needed to give direction for people that were trying to ascend into the hill of the Lord. And so you're obligated if a man has fasted and prayed and sought God, even though he may not have a scripture he can point his finger to, yet there is the unwritten law that is there that we must observe and we must live by. That's a conviction that you can stand on. And we have stood there for so many years. Then there is another conviction, and that's a personal conviction. And if it's a personal conviction with you, and you try to make everybody else line up with your conviction, it's no longer a conviction, it's spiritual pride. Because you want everybody to be just like you. And if they're not just like you, you're going to look at them from top to bottom and you're going to judge them and in your mind you're going to send them to hell because they don't have the same conviction that you have. All right. That's all right. I believe it. A few years ago we went to to uh, a district somewhere between the Atlantic and Pacific to preach camp meeting. <laughs> we got there. Our beautiful daughters had their hair piled on top of their head. looked so beautiful. But they were barefooted running around the campground. Finally, one of the leaders came to me and said, Brother Kilgore, we have a standard here that you should wear shoes, ladies should wear shoes, not only shoes, but with toes and heels in. And uh, their standard also was that the women let their hair hang down. My standard was hair put up, and you could go barefooted if you wanted to. <laughs> so I said, girls, you're going to have to put your shoes on. Glad to do it. And uh, I, you know, I, we were invited to a country somewhere overseas. And the RSF came to me and said, Brother Kilgore, where, where you're going, if the man and wife, if they're married, if they don't wear a ring, you're looked down on. You're classified. So I went to my wife. I said, what are we going to do? I said, should I buy you a little wedding ring? And... She said, I've been wanting a ring for 33 years. <laughs> and said, uh, you wouldn't give me one when I wanted it. You're not about to put a ring on my finger now. <laughs> so we went there and we preached and we made it all right. Of course, we haven't been invited back, so I don't know what the outcome is. I was in a Bible college where for two and three hours every Sunday morning we were taught if you wear one speck of jewelry, you're going to go to hell. If you drink a cup of coffee, you might as well drink a glass of beer. And the first cup of coffee I drank, I just figured a bolt from heaven was going to strike me dead and I was on my way. Now that's how strong they were. But what I am telling you, there are some things that are a personal conviction. The Spirit strikes your heart. And the way you develop that is when you're in a meeting and you want to draw close to God and you're saying, God, whatever it takes, whatever you want me to do, I'll go barefooted if I need to. I'll throw my necktie away if you want me to. But I want to develop something in here that's strictly between you and me. 
and I want it to be a sacred thing, and I want it to be a precious thing, and I want it to be a holy thing, and it will become a part of my life. And so the Spirit strikes in my soul, and I want to make a consecration, and I want to draw close to God, and I want to tell you that I made some consecration when I was just a boy that I have lived with for all of these years. I have never preached it. I've never tried to force it on anybody because I remember the meeting where I got so stirred I wanted to get on my hands and knees and crawl to get to an altar just to get close to God. And I said, Lord, if you'll do this, I will do that. And it becomes a sacred and a precious thing with me. Just like Jephthah out on the battlefield when he wanted to win the victory, he said, God, I'm desperate. Whatever it takes to win the battle, I'm willing to do it. And I tell you what, God, I'll make a vow to you. The first thing that comes out of my house that makes a shadow, I'll offer it to you. That was a personal conviction. There was no command that he do that. And we don't find where anybody else ever did it. But his daughter said, uh, Daddy, if you made that consecration, and if it involves me, that's all right. Don't you worry about it. I'm willing to go. I'm willing to cooperate. I'm willing to do what you want me to do. It was a personal conviction. What I am saying here today, we need to get our minds all and our thoughts and our, our uh, uh, judgmental spirits off of people and say, you're holy and you're not holy. You're clean. You're not unclean. You don't look just like I do, so you're not in the kingdom of God. And I'm not talking about Bible holiness that has a conviction where you point your finger to it and say, that's it. We're not going to compromise. Our women are not going to wear pantsuits. Amen. Our women are not going to cut their hair. Our women are not going to go the way of the world. They love this book too much for that. Praise God. Hallelujah. So unless you would go away from here on misunderstanding, I want to set the record straight here tonight. We're not going to go that route. But don't force something that's personal and precious and sacred to your heart on somebody else. If I give up coffee, I'm not going to force that conviction on Brother Mangan. That's a personal thing between me and God. I'm talking about allowing the Spirit to strike the anvil of your soul. Strike away some of the happiest days my boyhood days was around the old blacksmith shop. There was one man that I watched. His hands were so calloused and rough that he could pick up a live coal and toss it around in his bare hands. Those hands had handled live coals for so many years and iron pieces. I watched him as he would turn the crank and heat up the fire. That fire would be so hot it would turn blue but the iron that was in it would turn red and he'd take it out and put it on the anvil and he'd take that big old hammer and he'd start beating he'd pull another piece of iron out and he would beat that iron on top of that old plow plowshare and he would make a fine plow point and when it cooled it off there it was molded and it could go back into the field again and could produce what was needed for the farmer. What we are doing around here in these meetings, we're just allowing the Lord to turn the red-hot fire upon us, and we're being melted together. I need some of Brother Jeff Arnold. I need some of Brother Mike Williams. I need some of Brother Tenney. I need a whole lot of Brother Barnes. I need a whole lot of Brother Mangan. I need something that Brother Stone King has here tonight. Then get me in that fire and blend us all together and pound us all together. And then when we leave here, we're going to get out in the field and we're going to be a little sharper. We're going to plow through the field and we're going to reap the harvest before the sun goes down, before the coming of the Lord.
Praise God. Lord, to strike me, strike the anvil of my soul again. Hallelujah. I don't have it made. I need a lot of striking with the Spirit. Get a hold of me. Don't let me go yet, Lord. Oh, God, help me to be everything that you want me to be. Let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Bless that holy name of Jesus. Praise God. The fourth dimension is where the Spirit moves upon your heart and it brings into harmony and it's like the ringing of a bell. Now turn today to the 28th chapter of the book of Exodus. And I read where God designed that the priest's garment would have a golden bell, a blue pomegranate, a golden bell, a purple pomegranate, a golden bell, and another pomegranate all around the bottom of that priest's garment so that when he went into the Holy of Holies, there would be a constant tingling. There would be the ringing of the bells. That was a sign he was still alive. That was a sign he was able to go into the very presence of God and he would not fall dead because of the ringing of the bells that brought him in harmony with the mind of the Lord. I like that because if the United Pentecostal Church ever reaches that place of the ringing of the bells and that perfect harmony, we won't, we won't have to go lay hands on people in a service like this. They'll stand to their feet and say, I've got a miracle in my life. It just happened. Because we have come to that beautiful place of harmony. We have finally reached that outer space of weightlessness where it can flow together and blend together and there will be no division. Praise God. I pray for you if you came to this meeting with your feelings on your shoulder. I pray for you if you came to this meeting with their hands folded to just look over the congregation and to criticize. I pray for you. We need to hear the tingling of the bells. We need to hear the ringing, the constant ringing. Hallelujah. And that's where we need to be in the Spirit. Brother Libby's preached it today. What a message. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. What would happen to all of us if all of a sudden we'd start speaking in that heavenly language and the bells would start ringing and the saints would start singing and the glory of God would start moving and all of a sudden we felt we were ascending into the hill of the Lord and we're standing in His holy place. We'd reach that fourth dimension. God bless a woman in this church that has fasted for how many days? 30 days fasted that every preacher that stood up here was anointed of the Holy Ghost. God bless that handmaiden of the Lord. It sounds to me like some bells are ringing somewhere. It sounds to me like the angels want to sing somewhere. It sounds to me like the saints are ready to rejoice. Hallelujah. It sounds to me like we're drawing close to that throne, to that holy presence, to that glory, to that power, to that miracle. We're drawing close to that wonderful touch of God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, God, help us in this hour to reach that fourth dimension. Hallelujah. 
How long has it been since you talked in other tongues? You know, when I pray, I don't like to be disturbed. I, I, I found me a place the other day, and I thought, I thought I was just getting so close to the throne. And all of a sudden, the lights in the auditorium came on. And uh, an inspector had to be shown through the auditorium. I thought in my mind, here I am so close, and I'm interrupted with such carnality. And I thought, well, I'll stop and start over. And then I thought, no, I'm not going to stop and start over. I'm too close to what I want. I had to ignore that, and I broke through speaking in that heavenly language. I felt like that I, I was being carried away. The Spirit helps our infirmities. We know not what we should pray for as we should, but the Spirit makes intercession within us with groanings that cannot be uttered. When you're getting close to the throne, you may not be able to say anything, but, Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Or you may get a high voice and say, Hallelujah. You don't care who hears you. The president could walk in. You could care less. You know that you're ascending into the hill of the Lord and you're standing in the holy place. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Before this meeting is over tonight, it would be good if everybody could talk in that heavenly language, communicate in the spirit, and draw close to the hill of the Lord and the holy place. Bless your heart. If we can get there, every need will be supplied. Every sick body will be healed. There will be miracles here. Bless the Lord. Let's all stand and worship the Lord. and worship the Lord.